Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go ahead. Uh, it is the healing and communion rally, so we're going to talk about the, the subject of healing or something in line that will produce and help with faith for healing. Let's go to Proverbs 18.1. I'm sorry, 1821, not 1821, 1821. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Hallelujah. And then whoso findeth the wife findeth good. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I was going to say, you know, you, you, know, you men out there, uh, one of the ways you can stay well is to not back talk your wife. I just kind of threw that in there for fun. No, no, no. We're on verse 21 is really what we're on. I'm just messing with you. Uh, a death and life are in the power of the tongue. We'll talk about it a little bit tonight. Um, and it may not be very long, but we'll be, we will talk about the role that confession plays in healing. Now, we know that there are numerous ways to be healed. Uh, you can be healed by just, by your own faith in the, wor in the word of God and receive from the Lord and be healed. You can be healed by, uh, through the laying on of hands of the elders of the church with the anointing of oil. The prayer of faith from them will heal the sick. <clears throat> you can be healed by a gift of the Spirit. Gifts of healings and manifestation and demonstration by the, through the laying on of hands that way. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> you can be healed by prayer cloths. God brought special miracles by Paul. In as much as, you know, a handkerchief, I believe that's uh, Acts 19, 12, I believe, or 12. I, I, I get those back, backwards sometimes in my thinking. So we'll just kind of uh, go and make sure I give you the right scripture reference. And it is Acts 19, 11, and 12. So that God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul in as much as, I mean, so that from his body were break, take, brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. Diseases departed from them and evil spirits went out of them. Now notice that it said God wrought. Paul was the vessel. I said Paul was the vessel. It was still God. So Paul wasn't um, working the miracles as it were. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. It was the anointing on his life. All right. So there are numerous ways. Uh, um, and I remember Annie, if with, uh, when Durant, when she was with... Uh, uh, the Raymond Singers and band traveling a lot of times after, the, you know, when Brother Hagin began to minister, uh, he, you know, she'd stand up and say, now one way, not the only way, but one way that people are healed is through the laying on of hands. And, uh, you know, we, we, there's a, there, there are those things. So there's different methods uh, to administer the anointing. Now, there is a role in, 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 in some arenas of healing where your confession plays the role. Okay? So let's go over to... Um, Matthew, I'm sorry, not Matthew, Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And uh, we know the story of verse 20 of Mark 5. It says, and he departed, began to publish in the capitalist how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. Um, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now here we have, uh, and Jesus said, uh, Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now, we have here... We have one of the things right here. This man has obviously heard that by laying, that Jesus laying hands on people, they got healed. That's why Jairus came and said, come, come lay your hands on my daughter. She'll be made whole. She'll be healed. And so we have uh, at least the, the knowledge from what this is saying here that there are people that were broadcasting and telling, hey, I went to Jesus. He laid hands on me or laid hands on my family member or a loved one or whatever, and they were healed. Okay, so we know that's taking place because he's heard this enough. And he saw Jesus, man, he falls at his feet and says, come lay your hands on my daughter. Okay, he didn't, now listen, he didn't say let the centurion speak the word only. He didn't say send a prayer call. He said, so what he had heard, what he had heard was that you could get Jesus to lay hands on people and they'd be healed. Now notice as he went with her, the multitude thronged him. And a, certain, and a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, 
That's a long time to be anemic, to be that kind of anemic. To be, to be having a, 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 a blood discharge out of your body where you're just constantly in an anemic state. You know, how many remember the old Geritol commercials? Geritol for iron poor blood. You know, of course, they used to say, well, the old country folks didn't need Geritol because they cooked everything in cast iron frying pans or cast iron pots. You know, Dutch ovens, cast iron frying pan, we, we cooked in those. And so you got, your, you got your iron out of that. But then Geritol came in there to fix us. Hallelujah. Anybody ever have to take Geritol? Don't raise your hand. I don't even know if they sell Do they even sell it anymore? They still sell it. Okay. They used to have you know, for iron poor blood. Well, this woman was, was anemic. I mean, and you know, when you get anemic like that, you get weak. All right? So she had an b- issue of blood 12 years and suffered many things of many physicians. Each one thought they had the cure. They had the fix. They had a way to take care of it. Okay? Spent all that she had was nothing better, but rather grew worse. And let me say this. Once she spent all she had, she probably lost all of her doctors. Yeah. All right? I mean, she had spent everything. She, had. She, she wasn't getting any better. She grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Well, hallelujah. Thank God she did that. Why did she do that? What was the motivation to come touch his clothes? And the next verse tells us, for she said. Now, we've, we've taught this before, but we'll teach it again for those who may be listening on the Internet or be, never heard that before. Um, she said the, the, the Greek tense here is, is, is not a tense of she said it once. It was, a, it was in a continual sense. So she said and kept on saying. You could, and one translation actually says that. She said and kept on saying. For she said and kept on saying. In other words, she got her confession, and she was like a, a, a bulldog with a bone. She wasn't going to let go of it. All right? <clears throat> so she made her declaration. When he got close enough by, it said that she went and came in, pre- in the press and touched him, or his garment, for she said. She had been saying it at least sometime. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. That's the virtue's power, miraculous power. Turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? That's here, you know, at least in this account. He didn't say who touched me. He said, who touched my clothes? Wow. He was aware not only did she, did she that not only had virtue gone out of him, but he was aware somebody just touched his clothes and caused it to go out. Wow. Hallelujah. And his spiritual leadership team, a.k.a. the disciples, said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me. Now there is a hint. No. This statement is dripping with sarcasm. All right? I mean, they're kind of like going there. They're sitting there looking at this, and they're thinking. I, 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 I kind of like get, get that, that maybe Peter turned to James or John, the sons of thunder, and said, guys, did, did he not sleep good last night? Well, I, I thought he slept pretty good, but, you know, I, did, I fell asleep myself. I don't know. Well, I thought you had the third, third watch. Yeah, but, I, you know, he was asleep when I woke up. Oh, okay. Lord, you see the whole crowd here. Why are you asking us who touched your clothes? And the implication is, everybody's touching you. Well, the Bible says all the way back up here, and the multitude thronged him. Amen. He went with them. Hallelujah. And uh, the multitude, and they thronged him. They're just knocking all against him. People touching him, trying to figure out who he is, trying to figure out if they touched the superstar, you know. I mean, they're going to go write the rock opera, Jesus Christ Superstar or something. I mean, they touched him. You know, they're, going, they're never going to wash their hands again. They touched the, 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 the prophet. Okay? And um, notice he didn't even answer them. When they said that, he just, he's, he's, you, you know Jesus had to have moments of, I know they'll get it one day. They had to. 
Peter's always sticking his foot in his mouth. The disciples making stupid statements. You know, shall we send them away to get food? Well, it's three days far. It's too far to send them, you know. Um, you know, and after all the miracles he worked out, remember, he worked so many miracles, signs, and wonders that John wrote, he said, I suppose the world itself could not contain the volumes of the books if everything was written down that he did. Now, not necessarily that, you know, that was an accurate statement. It was more of, a, uh, uh, of an allegory. He did so many things, we just can't write it all down. All right? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And then he picks up there with, the, with Jairus' story. Okay? So we move on from there to Jairus' story. So here we have Jesus on his way to, to lay hands on some little girl and get her well. And in the middle of that, this woman comes in in the press. Now here's the, here's the beautiful thing about this is, uh, or the interesting thing, beautiful, interesting, whatever, is she had no right to be there. She was unclean. And because she was unclean, she was, when she came out in public and people were near her, she had to stop and say, I'm unclean, or cry, unclean, unclean, so they could move away from her. It was her responsibility to notify people. Now, boy, wouldn't that have been great if we'd done that with AIDS? Remember when AIDS came out? They, the, the laws got passed so you didn't, the doctors couldn't tell anybody if somebody had HIV. Go back and study it. it they made it a political disease. Yeah. If it had been bubonic plague, they would have quarantined them and let, them just, let that group either make it or not, but they were not going to go into the public. When HIV came out, because it was primarily in the homosexual community, it was a PC disease, and they were not allowed to share information with anybody if somebody had AIDS. Stupid. And then you're talking about, you know, because it was, it, because it got, then it got into the, all the things and got into the heterosexual <clears throat> bloodstream because through transfusions and et cetera. You know, she had to cry unclean. Man, for what, what if we had people with communicable diseases had to cry unclean, unclean, yeah. so people could avoid them? Amen. It'd be different. It'd be different. Well, she was supposed to do that. But see, what happened here, she got to talking about her face so much she got caught up with, you know, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. That she got out. She just didn't even, she didn't even care. She's in the press. She gets there. I can touch him, I'll be whole. She, she's going for her miracle. Amen. She's going for her miracle. She's going to go get her miracle. Amen. And so her confession gets involved here. And see, the, the, our words have power. Our words have authority. The, the, proverb, uh, the writer of Proverbs says that uh, life and death are in the power of the tongue. They that love us shall eat the fruit, of the fruit thereof. Amen. We, we, our words govern. I mean, I've told this story. I, I don't know if I told it here or over Winston said it, but I can't remember where I told it, so I'll tell it again here. And I've told it here before. But, you know, back, uh, back in, in Tulsa when FCF, you know, uh, Faith Christian Fellowship, Buddy Harrison started pastoring there in Tulsa. And they had the, um, they, they ended up at one time, they had four worship centers in the Tulsa area, north, south, east, and west. Uh, ultimately, they, you know, they, they were, they're down now to what is called Father's House over in, in, in uh, southwest Tulsa. But when Buddy first opened that up, they, opened, they bought an old, um, like, Kmart shopping center up in north Tulsa. And, and then they bought the, um, the uh, Firestone Tire Store out front, and that became their offices. They turned their, that, big old fire, that big old store into their offices. And then the build, building sat 5,000 people. I was there for their opening night, their very first service, and the air conditioner tore up, and it was 105 that day in Tulsa. 115. 115 that day in Tulsa. So by the time we got to church, it was, down, it was down to about 95, and no air conditioning. And Norville was preaching. There's no air conditioning in the sanctuary. I think there's some of the other parts of the building, but the sanctuary didn't have the air conditioning. There's 5,000 people there because it's the night before camp meeting of that year. Night, camp meeting 1980. There's 5,000 people over there, SCF North or SCF, waiting to hear Norval preach. Praise the Lord. Well, that, that ministry, you know, that church went on for, for a good number of years, and, and that Brother Buddy was on the radio, and, um, and there's this woman home. She's, she's afflicted. She's bedridden almost. Not, not quite, but she can get out every once in a while. Well, she got to listen to him preach on healing and, you know, using your faith to get what you want from God. And she got to confess, man, if I can get to that church and he'll lay hands on me, I'll get healed. If I can get to that church and get hands on me, I'll be healed. 
And she got saying that and got saying it and saying it and saying it and over, over a period of, time, of weeks and so forth. Uh, finally, one day she said, this Sunday I'm getting up and I'm getting dressed and I'm driving over to that church and I'm going to get my healed. I'm going to be healed. Hands are going to be laid on me. I'm going to get healed. Well, so she's confessing that, confessing that, confessing that. Get yourself to the church. She drives up into the parking lot. Well, unbeknownst to her, there's a greeter inside the door, front door. And as, as this woman gets out and starts making her way up to the front doors, uh, the, the Lord speaks to the greeter and says, next person walks through the door, grab her and dance with her. So that lady, and then guess who the next person through the door is? It's that lady. She'd been confessing, if I can get to that church, you know, hands will get laid on me, I'll get healed. Now, it didn't say it had to be laid on your hands by, you know, like the normal way. That woman grabbed her hands. That's hands laid on you, isn't it? She walked through that door, that woman grabbed her and snatched her into the door and started dancing when they were in the lobby. She got healed. She was healed. She didn't have to go into the service again. So she got to go in service and enjoy the service well. Amen. Amen. What caused that? What brought that, to, what brought that into being? What brought a miracle to her? Well, she wasn't at home laying around going, well, you know, I'm like Eeyore. I'm here on the earth. No matter. I don't feel good. Life's bad, but I still am okay. It could be worse. You know? He, Eeyore doesn't, didn't get enough of Tigger in him. You know? Eeyore just, you know, I remember one, one, of the, one of the Winnie the Poohs, Eeyore's there, and they got, there's, a, there's a stick over him for shelter. And he's kind of just, well, no matter. You know, it's a good shelter. I mean, he just, just do I mean, you know, just come what, you know, okay, so rah, rah, whatever will be, will be. I mean, just whatever happens, okay, we'll just put up with it. <clears throat> You're not going to get miracles singing Doris Day songs, particularly K Sara Sara. Okay? You're not going to get miracles talking about how, how, you know, I, man, I just wish the Lord would show up and do something special for me like he did for them folks over there. Well, you're going to have to say things. One of the things we found out, see, your confession creates an expectancy. <clears throat> or it can create the lack thereof. I said it can create an air of expectancy or it can create the lack thereof. I remember I was listening to an old uh, audio tape one time. And um, it, it, was, it was recorded at Ramah. And uh, Sister Wilkerson was there. And she began to prophesy. Now, I'll tell you, when that woman opened her mouth to prophesy, and you get goosebumps just listening to her say, and duh. Because she goes, and duh. Kind of like Billy Bram. Billy Bram used to sit, go and sit with Sister Wilkerson in her house. And so that, that, those kind of uh, weird inflections that Billy has sometimes, when she, she talks about the glory. The way she says glory is weird, kind of different than her normal cadence of talking. That's because that's how Sister Wilkerson said it. She got, you see, you get around people, and you get around, you get hanging around them, and you'll pick up even, even sometimes mannerisms or, or vocal cadences just because you're around them a lot, and, and that their spirit got off on you, you know, and you'll pick up other things, and it's not that you're copying them, it just got off on you. Now, if you're doing it on purpose, that's another thing. But see, it'll, it'll get, it, it can get off on you. That spirit will get off on you. I, I, I remember Mark Brzee one, uh, one time when he was here. I, I, was watch, I kind of was watching, and he, he'd walk up and put, hang his feet off the edge of the platform and stand there and talk like this, and he, he, he'd start talking like this. It looked like, you know, Dad Hagen with a different face and a smaller belly. I'm, probably, I'm, sure, I'm probably sure Dad had a smaller belly when he, when he was called Stream Beans from Tom Bean, you know. Uh, you know, come Stream Bean from Tom Bean, he'd say, them days are gone forever. Hallelujah. But Sister Wilkerson said that she said that she not prophecy, and, and it's, it's always bugged me because I can't find that tape. I don't know where it is. But she said this in that prophecy. She said, atmosphere calleth me. And then she went and said this, whether for good or for evil, it calleth me. Now that's another word for the, for the era we're living in. We won't go into that word because we're talking about this. Our Confession can create an atmosphere of expectancy, or it can rob you of all hope. I said it can rob you of all hope. See, atmosphere of expectancy is hope. Then your faith gives substance to that. Amen? And you walk in it, praise God. I said you walk in it, praise God. 
Glory to God. So our confession, see this woman, she was laying around going, you know, uh, uh, if I can touch his clothes, I'll be whole. If I can touch his clothes, I shall be whole. If I can touch his clothes, I'll be whole. And kept saying this year, hey, he's in town. She gets up from there, runs out of there, gets there. Can you imagine um, what would happen to a lot of people? Had they finally got up and got over to where Jesus was, found all that throng around him, and you're unclean. And you're supposed to tell everybody, unclean, unclean. And there's all this noise and all this commotion going. There have been people who have dropped their souls, turned around, and went, oh, well, I tried. That's not faith. Faith doesn't try. Faith, like I said, is a bull, like a bulldog with a bone. You're not getting it away. You ever, ever follow a dog over a bone? I mean, just playing with them. You know, you know they're, they're, they're toys. Uh, Jess and Cap's new little beagle. Now, she loves to get a hold of the leash and just tussle with it. You sit there. You can, you can take her and roll her. I mean, flip her over here and she'll just roll like this. And she'll come up with that thing in her mouth. She's not letting go. I mean, she is not letting go of that, that leash. And it's hilarious. She can take her and roll her back and forth, back and forth. And she'll come up. I got it. I got, I got the leash. Hallelujah. Well, see, we've got to be that way with our faith. We've got to hold fast our profession. Amen? You know, we're to hold fast. Why? Because if you'll touch his harm, the hem of his garments, you'll be whole. Amen? If you'll touch but his clothes, you'll be whole. You've got to hold fast. Amen? Uh, Hebrews 4.14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? He's faithful that promised. I said he's faithful that promised. We cannot let go of what we're believing God for. We got to get a hold of it and we got to run with it. We got to stay with it and we can't quit. So our confession in the realm of receiving from God in all areas, but see, we're talking about healing. See, you got it. You, you can't just go, well, I went to the doctor. No, it's amazing. People will go to the doctor and start confessing with everything the doctor said. Well, he said, I don't have but two years. You know, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I, I mean, you know, I hope y'all will, will come visit my grave. I mean, people start talking like that. I hope you'll come visit my grave. I hope y'all come see me before I die. You know, I don't, I don't have but two years left. That's not a confession of faith. I said, that's not a confession of faith. You're starting to confess or declare something that, you don't even, that hasn't even happened. Well, you know, uh, now, now, sweetie, I hope, I hope when I die, you'll go marry somebody else. You know, start picking out a new wife for him. Well, she'd make a good wife for you after I'm gone. Let me tell you what's not in the room. Faith! You've got to have the hope, the expectancy. You've got to start speaking that which the Word says if you're going to change the atmosphere. And atmosphere calls him. Atmosphere summons the presence of the Lord. Hello. Now you can speak unbelief all day long and you won't, you won't summon his presence to come do anything for you. Matter of fact, several devils might show up at your house. Hey, uh, then, what are you doing here? Well, I heard somebody calling all the poverty devils over today. We, we came over to enforce our poverty. And we got we to have hope. And hope comes out, that, and we got to change that atmosphere, and we got to start saying it. Now, this woman, I'll, I'll, I'll bet you the first time she heard that people touching Jesus' garments got healed, she didn't just jump up and go, Woo! Glory to God, I'm going to go find him. And she said and kept on saying. She changed the atmosphere of her circumstances. Now, listen, you got to think, this woman's been in this state 12 years. It was nothing better, but rather grew worse. So you could be a long time. Remember one guy Jesus went up to in the psalmist's porch. This man had been a long time in that state. He said, will you be whole? He said, well, I had nobody put me in order. When the water's trouble, somebody gets him ahead of me. That's not the question. The question was, was not, why aren't you healed? Will you be healed? Okay. And this woman obviously heard, and she had to start. She, she probably said, well, man, man, if I touch his clothes, I could get well. She probably started out with, if I could and I, I would. And kind of, you know, kind of went down that road of, man, if it was just, if it was just the right day, oh, man, you know, I, if I may but touch his clothes, she said, I, may, I shall be whole. And then she, it, it went from the, it, you can say the same thing, but the attitude behind it. 
man, if I could just get to him, I might get well. To, if I can touch him, I'll get well. In other words, it went from a kind of res- a, a, a defeatist statement of, if I could just get to him, I could get well to if I can get to him and get touch his clothes, I'll get well. So that moves you to action. What's, what's happened there? The confession has moved you out of wishing into Bible hope in the faith so that you go act on it. You're no longer just kind of, boy, I mean, I just wish I could get to Jesus and touch him. Man, I, I might could get well. She got over to that place where hope began to spring. And the atmosphere, you've got to know the atmosphere in her place wasn't great. I mean, she's been to every doctor, many physicians, suffered many things, and then they tried all kinds of stuff. You know, doctors over the years have done, you know, how many remember back in the, uh, the, the, the 16, 17, 1800s, they used to bloodlet all the time. They bring in, you, you can even find pottery where it was doctors bloodletting things. You know, it's got a, a little a loop where you can lay your arm in it so they could cut you and just drain blood out of your body. They thought bloodletting would get you well. And they drain blood all in there, and they were the you know, they were the doctor, and they they taught, they learned somewhere that somebody's idea was you know they're, what are they doing? they're practicing medicine. I, you know, if I went to the hospital today and they brought out that bowl and set it on the bed with one of my family members and said, you know, we're going to bloodlet," I'd, I'd slap them and walk back out the door with them. Them, not the not the person was trying to bloodlet them. I'm going somewhere else. Hello. She suffered many things. I mean, they may have told her to eat, you know. Uh, turnip weed or something. I don't know. They, you know, they, they she suffered many things. They kept trying all kinds of experimentations on her to get her well, and nothing was working. She just got worse and worse and worse. So the atmosphere in her home could not have been great. Plus, now she's an outcast in society because she's unclean. So now she can't, she, there's, a, there's no rest at home. There's no rest in public. But she heard of Jesus. And she had been saying, if I can touch him, I'll be whole. If I can touch him, I'll be whole. She said and kept on saying it. See, her confession got involved to the point it changed the atmosphere. From the atmosphere of Eeyore to the atmosphere of Tigger. To the atmosphere of doom and gloom to the atmosphere of faith. Amen. And she was able in that moment to rise up because it changed the atmosphere so much. She, grew, she got up out of that bed and went out in the public and did not care that there was a press around Jesus. She forced her way through, touched his garment, so, and, and power went out of Jesus in such a strong manner. He said, who touched my clothes? Now, I, I'm going to tell you something. If we brought all the youth over here right now and banged them all up against me and everybody kind of gathered around, everybody's laying hands on me, and somebody reached down and just kind of t- brushed the, uh, my cut, my pant leg down at the bottom or something like that, just enough to touch it, I wouldn't know somebody touched that. But Jesus felt the power go out. Hallelujah. He felt virtue go out. Now, of course, the, the theological world goes, he, he healed the woman with the issue of blood to prove he was the son of God. No, she got healed because she said and kept on saying. And when, she got, and when she finally came down and told him all the truth, Jesus didn't go. You know, woman, I'm the son of God. Power went out of me because I'm the son of God. If that were true, everybody walking around would have got healed. Everybody was touching him and thronging him would have gotten healed and gotten delivered and everything else they needed from God. They would have got it because they were touching him. It was the touch of faith based on her confession her confession was not if I can touch his body, if I, but if I can touch his clothes. She didn't say, man, if I can just get his clothes. If I can get the garment. If I can brush up against that, I'm going to get well. And uh, guess what? She did. I said she did. She got exactly what she said. Praise God. Why? Because her confession created the atmosphere of faith. Everybody say, your confession can create the atmosphere of faith whereby you receive from heaven. Glory be to God. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody else say hallelujah. All right. So her, 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 her faith confession created an atmosphere whereby she could receive from God. So, you know, when people are in need of healing, they need to start speaking things. They need to get into the word and start declaring the word. Start saying what the Word says. Start saying what God said about it. Amen? Somebody else say glory. glory. 
Hallelujah. So you're, the confession of a believer in, in lines with uh, receiving healing is one of the ways we can receive healing. Now, because of that type of expectancy, think God does all kinds of things in that atmosphere. You can get somebody who's in so much faith and has such an expectancy, it sets the whole room off. I was, um, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but Kevin and Annie were with us. They were at the house and um, we were talking uh, after a service. And um, they got talking about, they had, they had recently been down, and, and this, now this is probably 10 years ago, so you know, I don't know when this, this actual meeting took place, but uh, they were down at a Benny Hinn meeting in Atlanta. Well, how many of you have ever been around uh, Atlanta on the Beltline, the world's largest parking lot. Okay, now they're either doing 100 miles an hour or no miles an hour. That's your choices on the Beltline. They're driving like it's the it's the it's the Atlanta Motor Speedway, or they're not driving at all because there's been a wreck or there's so much traffic on it. Well, they're at the Coliseum there in Atlanta. I'm not sure which one it was. I don't know, you know, because it's been a number of years. You know, cities tear coliseums down so much and build new ones all the time. It's ridiculous. But wherever they were having the meeting, uh, they, they're sitting there, and it's time for church, and they, they come up on the, uh, on the, over the uh, speaker and say, look, Brother, Brother Benny's out on the, uh, on, the, on the belt line, hung up in traffic, and, he, and we don't know when he's going to get here. You know, because, listen, when, once you get hung up, it could be an hour, hour and a half, two hours before you get anywhere you're trying to get to. It's just the way it is. They need about 10 lanes across. They need stacked bridges that run all the way around Atlanta. You know, all right. People who are going all the way to the other side get to get up there and don't, you don't get off. There's no exits until you get off to the other end of town. You know, something, I don't know. Um, and so they're just kind of sitting there. Well, finally, you know, you know, a bunch of charismatics. You get a bunch of charismatics together. They're not going to sit there. Somebody's going to try to out-spiritualize the other. So somebody starts singing some, some, some scripture courses, you know. I don't know. Maybe it was somebody from the full gospel businessman. They started singing, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation. If you went, old days, you used to go to full gospel businessmen's meeting, and they'd stand outside waiting for the doors open going, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. It was kind of like the theme song for the, for the full gospel businessmen. Well, somebody starts singing a chorus, and then the next thing you know, they're all kind of just got to singing. And they did this for, you know, a little while. And, but the atmosphere was getting charged with an expectancy. Now, people had come there to get healed. I said people had come to get healed. Some people driven hours to get into that meeting, to get their healing. They needed answers from heaven. They needed a supernatural answer from heaven. And they'd come, they'd come, and they're sitting there. And all of a sudden, uh, uh, Kevin and said, said, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I seeing somebody just jumped up and started screaming, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. Well, the next, they said, all of a sudden, it went like popcorn in a popcorn bag in the microwave. People just started jumping up all over the place, screaming they were healed. What caused that? See, that atmosphere. See, they've been, they, they, I, I, I'm going to, people have had to have said, I'm going to that Benny Hinn meeting and I'm getting my healing in Jesus' name. I'm going to that meeting and I'm getting my healing in Jesus' name. He didn't even get in the building, people were getting healed. Why? Because the atmosphere got created by the confession. Amen. Amen. And that's why a lot of times, and especially particularly in the charismatic renewal in those days, you had a lot of things happening in the big means because people would come and they'd just have an expectancy. They'd be saying, of course, they go back to the churches. The church is saying, well, you know, you need to stay away from that Copeland. You need to stay away from that Hagen. You don't need to be around that Copeland Hagen. They're, you know, they're just all, you know, they're all puff and bluff, and, you know, and they don't have anything. Well, no wonder there's no ex nothing happening in your church. Nobody, no wonder nobody's ever getting healed in your church. You ain't even, I mean, you don't even believe it yourself. I know you joined the church and you said, I believe in divine healing as in the atonement. But, you know, you really don't believe it. Because you get up every other week and preach about Job and preach about the man born blind and preach about the woman with the issue. Uh, now, what was the other one? There was, there was another one. That, um, man born blind, Job, and there was a, huh? Yeah, Paul's thorn. Got Paul's thorn. I mean, you're preaching. Why, that's why everybody can't have it and there's no expectancy. You're not going to get answers where there's no expectancy. There has to be expectancy in the atmosphere. We create that with our confession. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at 
office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.